Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started, I just want to let you guys know that this week's episode is brought to you by my new online course, Become a Superhuman. And yes, it sounds exactly like the title of the podcast, but this is actually an online course where we go into the various aspects of improving your health, specifically your endocrine health. More specifically, yes, more specifically, getting your testosterone up to the optimal levels. Now, whether you're a male or a female, as we've learned in numerous episodes of the show, testosterone is the ultimate feel-good motivation, improved health, improved fitness, improved body composition, super drug, okay? So everything from your mood to your recovery time and everything in between is affected by your body's endocrine health. And what my team and I have done is we've actually taken years of my own self-experimentation years of research, every possible literature and study we could find, and we've condensed it into a simple three to four hour program that you can follow along and make simple, safe, and easy adjustments to your lifestyle to improve your endocrine health. Now, as listeners of this podcast, you can get a very special discount by visiting jle.vi slash t. That's J-L-E dot V-I, just like my name, slash T for testosterone. This episode is brought to you by Organifi. You know, the one thing that literally every single diet and nutrition expert that we've had on the show seems to agree on is that we need to eat more veg and get our greens and consume all natural products. But let's be honest. How many of us actually have the time? Well, recently I had the opportunity to meet some of the folks over at Organifi and I've been absolutely blown away by them and their product. You see, Organifi is an organic superfood green juice powder that literally covers all your nutritional bases without having to eat five bowls of kale. It saves you loads of time, loads of money, and a lot of chewing. And really all you have to do is add water and drink it. So to check it out and save an incredible 20% off your first order, visit Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, and use coupon code SUPERHUMAN at checkout. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to today's show. You guys, today we are joined by Vinny Tortorich, a public speaker, celebrity trainer, author, and podcaster. You guys, for the better part of the last few decades, Vinny has been working with people from all walks of life, ranging from Ironman athletes to celebrities and even everyday folks to help them understand and stay in shape and lose weight. He is known as America's angriest trainer because of his views on the fitness and diet industries and just the kind of unfair manipulation and misinformation that they've been responsible to for for the last few decades. You've also probably heard him every other week on Adam Carolla's show, among others, and even his own podcast. Now, in this episode, we talk about a range of very interesting stuff from diet and nutrition to the particulars on how weight loss and weight gain actually work and the kind of metabolic nitty gritty information that you guys know I love to get into. Even though this is stuff that we have covered quite a few times on the show, somehow I still manage to learn quite a bit of new stuff. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy the episode. So without any further ado, please enjoy Mr. Vinny Tortorich. Mr. Vinny Tortorich, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you so much for making the time. As you were telling me before we hit record, you had a pretty busy and exciting day today. So I know uh, your time is very valuable. We appreciate it. No, uh, Jonathan, thank you for having me. You know, it's funny, since I've been in this podcasting game, either I'm doing my show all day long because I do five brand new episodes every week and I do other people's show. I was telling you about that, you know, I, I do Adam Carolla's show and a lot of the other shows at Corolla Digital. So either I'm here doing my show or I'm over at Corolla Digital doing some of his shows. Amazing. Do you find it to be more or less satisfying than working directly with clients to be all day in front of a microphone? 
at first I hated it <laughs> because, look, I've spent an entire lifetime working with clients directly, you know, hands on, showing up at someone's house and getting them to get in shape and teaching. You know, I'm basically a school teacher that somehow figured out that I can make a living by helping people lose weight and get in shape. This all started because of a book I wrote, uh, Fitness Confidential. And before I know it, I'm doing three podcasts a week and then four podcasts a week and now five a week. <laughs> so that becomes a full-time job. And I walked around for a couple of years when people would say, well, what do you do for a living? You know, my friends would say, what do you do now? <laughs> and I would literally answer them by saying, I don't know. Nice. Because it wasn't satisfying to me because, you know, when you're talking into a mic and it's just going out into the ether, if you will, you don't feel the effect. You don't see that you're helping anyone except your own bottom line. You know, yeah, I knew I was selling a lot of books and I knew that I had people who wanted to sponsor my podcast and pay for me to go give talks. But I didn't like it at first. And then when I started looking on Twitter and there was these Facebook groups that cropped up with my name on it. There's a group now with, I think, I want to say there's 18 or 20,000 people in it. It actually is called Vinnie Tortorich's No Sugars, No Grains, and I don't own the group. Oh, wow. I'm a member like everyone else in that group, and people are in there who have lost 100, 150, 200, 250 pounds, and you look at that and you go, my God, I couldn't have ever done this if – all of this hadn't started somehow. Yeah, I can totally relate to this feeling of, uh, you know, not really connecting to the people and just broadcasting and not knowing. And that's one of the reasons that I always push so hard for people to leave reviews or send us messages, because it really does make a difference when you're just looking into a screen and you don't really know. And when you do get the 1% or half a percent of people who message you and are like, hey, I quit my job. I changed everything. It's incredible. I thank you so much. It makes such a huge difference and just motivates me you know, to do another 100 episodes. Yeah. How long have you been going at it? If you don't mind me interviewing you for a second. Oh, yeah. We've been at it a year and a half. Are you liking it? I like it. I have to say it, it gets tricky when, I mean, we'll get into the questions today, right? And we'll talk about no sugar and no grains. And it gets tricky to find new ways to approach because at the end of the day, there's like four or five things that are really going to help people achieve superhuman performance and their diet, exercise, meditation, memory techniques, and fixing your sleep. And so yeah. approaching those topics 15, 20, 30 times each from new and exciting ways is always a challenge, but I always meet incredible people and build relationships. And I think that's what makes it for me so rewarding in addition to yeah. obviously impacting people. Great. And that's all you have to do. Precisely. So Vinny, let me ask you this. You kind of touched on a school teacher who at one point figured out you could make a living in diet and exercise. Tell me a little bit about that origin story, because that's really interesting there. I mean, at what point did your life go down this trajectory? How did you become so fascinated in diet and exercise, so on and so forth? Yeah, I kind of, you know, I capsulated that a bit in my book, Fitness Confidential. I was kind of an outcast kid. By my eighth birthday, I was kind of a kid being picked on and chastised at school. And there was a guy, well, I turned on the television. You wouldn't remember this. You're way too young. <laughs> and there was a guy named Jack LaLanne that was on TV way back. And we're talking 1970. And I'm watching this. And the only thing I can take from Jack LaLanne was that he was like a real life superhero. You know, when you're a kid, you realize that Superman is not real and Batman is not real. <laughs> But this guy was real, and he was lifting heavy things over his head. Therefore, he had these big muscles. And I felt that if I could do that, then I could be a superhero just like this guy, Jack. And it didn't take long for my parents to introduce me to this guy in my hometown. I grew up in a town of, of a few thousand people in the Deep South in Louisiana. And this guy, he was a family friend, a fellow Italian he taught me everything about weightlifting as an eight-year-old. And I became his first employee by the time I was 14 at his gym Cool. in my hometown. We built the gym together. So I started instructing people twice my age or even older by the time I was 14, 15, 16. So when I got to college to get a teaching degree, 
it became automatic for me to not just get a secondary education degree, but to also get a physical education degree and to study nutrition and everything else. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing was that I was at a school that really allowed for that. Tulane University is a medical school. So there was a lot to learn. There was a lot of science. That was the beginning. I just kind of stepped right into it. Amazing. Amazing. So break it down for me. I mean, we did talk about kind of how it's so difficult to approach this topic from different subjects. So I want to kind of get the core message out of the way so we can go a little bit deeper and touch on some new stuff. What's the secret? I mean, what is, I guess, let me ask it this way. Why are over 50% of Americans unhealthy? Why are Westerners unhealthy? Uh, You know, that's a loaded question, but there are a few things. I mean, if I can expound on it, one is we're given the wrong message. And the message started off wrong because basically we're trying to sell something that people shouldn't be doing. You know, we're trying to tell people that calorie in, calorie out is the way to do things. And just to name names, people like Jenny Craig or Weight Watchers is saying, hey, you can have a brownie. It's, it's okay as long as you stay within your your point That's system. Right. And Right. And, you know, to their own admission, and that's a Weight Watchers deal, to their own admission, they have a 2% attrition rate, which means it doesn't work 98% of the time. Jeez. And anyone near the science community would tell you that you're saying that you have a 2% attrition rate, that could be zero or negative two. So basically what we're saying is it doesn't work at all. Wow. If it did, everyone would be thin, yet we get heavier and heavier year upon year to where we have an obesity epidemic in this country and around the world. We're spreading our problem around the world. So obviously, calories don't matter when gaining or losing weight at all. Mm -hmm. So if calories don't matter, you have to start sitting there and wondering, well, what does matter? What will cause us to get fat? And it's not exactly the amount of calories we're eating, but it's what the calories we're eating, what they're causing to happen to our hormones. Mm. So, in fact, we gain weight or lose weight depending on our hormones. And the main hormones at play are you know, cortisol, leptin, ghrelin, and insulin. And if we could control those, we can control weight loss or weight gain, for that matter. Mm. So, elaborate on that. I mean, that's very interesting. Tell me how exactly we do that? How do we control those hormones? I'm just about to read. I I had to hold out on reading because I have a rule of not reading guests' books before the podcast episode, but I'm just about to dive into Rob Wolf's second book, Wired to Eat, which I think is going to talk a little bit about that, but I definitely could stand to learn a little bit more about the hormonal signaling of food and how we kind of, well, rewire, to borrow Rob's term, our bodies to respond to food differently. Yeah, you know, Rob is right. You know, we're all within earshot of each other when, when you, you know, I called it in my book, remapping, mm-hmm. same thing. What he's going to probably get into is talking a lot about insulin because insulin controls everything. Mm-hmm. So just to put it in a cartoon fashion that anyone can understand, if you are, let's say you ate something with sugar or bread, any kind of grain or a candy bar or pie or anything like that, Forget about the calories for a second and think about that sugar going into your stomach and then your stomach releasing it to your liver. Once it gets there, your liver sends a message to your brain. Hey, you know, Jonathan just put a lot of sugar in here and we got to do something with it. Mm -hmm. So the first thing your liver is going to do with that sugar is it's going to top off your sugar stores in your body. It's going to top off your blood. Is going to top off your muscles and it's going to top off your liver because in order to achieve homeostasis, you have to be topped off with sugar, right? We have to hit a certain level. The unfortunate part is basically you need about two teaspoons mingling around in your blood. And, you know, as you can imagine, you can eat 10 times that just for breakfast and breakfast or oatmeal or, you know, any kind of bread or bagels or you name it, pancakes, waffles, any of that would give you 10 times what you need for any day, right? So now your liver has to figure out what else to do with it. So the insulin starts to change the rest of the sugar that it couldn't convert into a long chain triglyceride. 
So you may have heard people say, oh, I went to the doctor. He told me my triglycerides are really high. That's happening because you're turning your sugars into long chain triglycerides. And a long chain triglyceride is a fancy word for a long chain fat. And then your body will store that sugar as a fat in your fat cells. Mm -hmm. So that's where the problem begins. And it's even more insidious than that. And Gary Taubes mentions this, I think, in both books, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, and also in Good Calorie, Bad Calorie. He gives examples of this where he says, you know, when a long chain triglyceride makes it into a fat cell, it doesn't want to come out. You know, it would rather, we use fat and out of fat cells all day long as currency, right? And when we have a long chain triglyceride going into the fat cell, it has a tendency of getting stuck in there. And Gary's uh, cartoon version of that is, it's like going out to Ikea and buying a bed. And when you get to bed to your house, you can walk it through the door because the mattress and box spring are separate and the, the frame is separate. Once you get it into the bedroom, you set it up, right? Think of that as being a long chain triglyceride. You cannot get that bed out of that bedroom unless you break it down again. And that takes a lot of time and effort. So your body just tends to not want to do it. Mm. Does that make sense? It does make sense. That's really, really interesting. I also really like Gary's work. And he's another one who uh, we've had on the show. I actually spoke with him this morning randomly. Okay, so I'm starting to get this. I think you add a, a really kind of interesting way of explaining it that I haven't gotten. So this, I guess, is how you arrived at no sugar, no grains, which is kind of, I would say, uh, your mantra. Talk to us a little bit about where grains fit in. I mean, I know that it's much more than just the, what are they called? Polysaccharides. Right. Or is it just that? Is it just that it's so easy with polysaccharides to fit in so many glucose molecules into the body? That's part of it, but it's even more insidious than that. You know, when I sat down, you know, I didn't want to write fitness confidential at all. I was forced by a friend of mine here in Hollywood, uh, Dean Laurie, who his name is on the cover of the book with mine. Dean is a big time producer and TV writer. One of his most notable pieces is uh, Arrested Development. And that's what people remember him from. And Dean begged me for years to write this book. And I kept saying no. And finally, one night we were having a scotch. And I guess by the time you get to your second scotch, you're sitting there and you're going, hmm. And the guy said, I should write this book. Maybe I should. He asked me why I didn't want to write it. And I said, because I'm not going to say anything that's popular. People want, you know, just they want to be tickled. Oh, tell me, just tell me what to do. And I don't have anything popular to say. And I've been, you know, espousing my stuff on Hollywood at this point for, you know, close to 30 years. And he says, well, you're the guy that Hollywood calls on when they need to get someone, quote unquote, red carpet ready. So why can't you just put that in the book? And I said, because a Hollywood actor or actress that has a movie to do, they don't care what it takes. They're, they're going to cash a bazillion dollar check. Mm -hmm. So if their agent says Vinny's coming in, listen to every word Vinny has to say, they're going to do that, Right. Because they don't want to know how the sausage is packed. They just want it done. Meanwhile, I would have to somehow convince the general public who's not going to make a bazillion dollars by losing weight that they should not only be giving up sugars, which I think most people inherently understand. Right. If they eat less haagen and less pie, they can possibly lose weight. I mean, we all kind of get that. I mean, wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, totally. The problem is... Telling people to give up their quote unquote heart healthy grains. Yeah. Right? Heart healthy. I love that. And that's where the problem begins. You know, we think of grains as, you know, we've been listening to commercials for 50 years calling them wholesome and good for you. And, you know, they're fortified with vitamins and iron. And let's start every day by eating a ton of heart healthy grains. And the American Heart Association says, have your special K. You will live long. And so, I'm the guy that's going to come out and tell people an oatmeal. I mean, come on, what's healthier than oatmeal? Right. I mean, can you think? So I'm going to be the guy that's going to come out and tell people, no, 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 no. You can't have that. That's right. worse. That's even more insidious than sugar. And the reason being is 
if you had straight sugar, if you took a teaspoon of straight sugar, you will get a glycogen spike that will cause an insulin spike. And that spike will last for a very short time. It will cause some harm, but not a major amount of harm. Yet, if you eat a couple of pieces of bread, you won't get a glucose spike. You'll get a glycogen load, right. which means your insulin will go up and it will stay up. You know, so for years we would have dietitians saying, hey, eat, you know, the simple carbs, don't eat that. Eat the mm -hmm. complex carbs, man. That's mm -hmm. better for you because they slowly make it to your liver. The part they left out and the part that they didn't know, because let's be honest, they really don't teach dietitians this stuff. The part they were leaving out is, hey, your insulin is going to spike and it's going to stay there for a long time. Right. Am I saying that in a way that anyone can understand it? Absolutely. I mean, that makes total sense. And I think that's what so many people are now starting to realize that at the end of the day, you know, we all thought it was calories in, calories out, but it's also this huge component of are you getting the sugar slow enough into the body? Because if you're not, then your body's just going to dump it into body fat. The body is not going to waste those calories. And you can only store so much glycogen in your liver. You can only store so much glycogen in your muscles. And then, you know, you go into this conservation mode, which is why we all carry around, well, not all of us, but many people carry around tens of thousands of calories in their gut. Yeah. And look, we don't even need, I go as far, and this makes me sound like a kook again, but I go as far as to say you don't need a whole lot in the way of fruit. You only need vegetables. I agree. You know, you get all the phytonutrients, you get everything you need from vegetables. I agree. And if fruit is nothing but nature's candy. Totally. <laughs> it's funny. Jimmy from Live in La Vida Low Carb said that to me once. That's and Jimmy I, I Moore. Yeah, Jimmy Moore. I love it. Well, I mean, and you think about it, though, the fruit that we eat today is, you know, available year round, which is not normal for fruit because with all that sugar, it it spoils on the tree in nature. And also, if you look at a kind of normal wild strawberry or a wild banana, the sugar content is so much lower that it's pretty obvious why modern fruit just doesn't suit us. By the way, vegetables have been modified to the same extent. I mean, today's tomatoes will stay not even in the fridge for weeks on end. That's not normal. But it seems that the modifications that they've made to vegetables, you know, to make lettuce have less carcinogens in it or less kind of toxins in it, to make cucumbers bigger and less bitter, that hasn't been as detrimental to us as the way that we've selectively, it's not even genetic modification, by the way, it's selective breeding, the biggest, sweetest fruit you can get your hands on. Yeah, and we've been doing that for years. And, you know, I've been yelling about that on my podcast for years. You know, when I was a kid, there was peach season and strawberry season, mm -hmm. you know, and the Vidalia onions would only come out at a certain time of year. And, you know, now you can get all of that stuff year round because we ship it around the world half frozen and we have refrigeration and everything else. So we've literally caused more of a problem because of the fruit. And I could go on and on about that. But, you know, when I talk about it too much, people think I'm bashing vegans. And it's like, no, 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 no. I'm just I'm not here trying to hurt anyone and I'm not here to bash anyone. I'm from the science world and I'm just giving facts. Mm -hmm. And these are facts. This is what happens. If you don't believe me, just look around. When I was a kid, if you saw one 300-pound guy in your hometown, that was a lot. You know, it was almost like a freak show to see a 300-pound guy. Now it's not unusual to see six, seven, eight hundred pound women. Mm -hmm. They're all over the place. Yeah, it's broken. I mean, the, the food system is broken. And what's worse is our knowledge about food is so wrong. I spoke with someone recently who has a degree in nutrition and just – I mean, would disagree with almost every point we made today, which I think, you know, is, is a big part of the issue. And, and it has to do with like, how much are we trusting the studies that are being put out or have been put out historically? And what's the source of those studies that say sugar is fine and fat is bad and that kind of thing? Yeah, you know, I get a lot of flack on that and I just don't listen to it. I just go, you know, it's science versus bro science. And mm -hmm. I'm not interested in lying to people or just sticking to an agenda just because when I went through registered dietitian school, they told me under no circumstances do you do anything other than what we tell you to do. Yeah. You know, and they're all kind of huddling together and sticking to their story. And by the way, a lot of them know that it's not right. 
Right. It's crazy. Right. Let me ask you this on another kind of really controversial topic, maybe more so than sugar, I would say. A lot of people, I think, still think that eating fat makes them fat. And we talked about this a lot on the show, but I like the way that you presented the sugar and glucose and glycogen argument. So I'd, I'd love for you to reiterate why exactly that's so wrong. Well, just talking about fat, by the way, one of the problems people have with fat is they think because they'll go, okay, well, Vinny and Gary and Nina Teicholz and all these different people are saying, no sugar, I can have all the fat I want. And then they take that too far, right? Mm. They'll say, well, um, fat won't make you fat because that's what we say, right? Fat won't make you fat. But we're talking about within the realm of a normal diet. You know, look, if you sit there and eat a pound of bacon every morning and drink bulletproof coffees all day and eat five avocados a day and just keep, you know, sourcing fat after fat after fat, well, obviously you're not going to lose weight. And some of those people will say, well, I'm in dietary ketosis, right? And that's all I have to, you know, everyone's always looking for what they can do with total impunity. And that's not what this is. This is not some fad diet that you can do with impunity. So if that's what you're thinking, forget it, folks. You can overdo anything. But in general, people who want to be in ketosis, and by the way, you don't have to be in ketosis to lose weight. But a lot of people go, oh, it's just easier for me. I want to be there. And they all have these blood ketone meters and they'll have the pee strips and everything else. And they'll write to me or they'll set up a consult with me and go, well, I'm in ketosis. I'm not gaining weight, but I stopped losing weight. And when they go into what they're eating, it's just amazing to me that they're not gaining weight. So think of it this way. Ketosis is not because you're eating a lot of fat. Ketosis happens because you're eliminating sugar. Mm -hmm. The story I like to tell, there was a woman named Gabriella. I've been telling the story for a few years because it really matters. Gabriella had some weight to lose, and she had lost a fair amount, 40 or 50 pounds. I can't really remember at this point. And uh, she had done a couple of consults with me, and then she called me up, and she was upset because she goes, you know, she goes, I lost weight for the first few months, and now I'm not losing weight. And I said, Gabriella, take me through your daily diet, what you're eating. And she's telling me the whole diet. And the first time through, it sounded perfect. And she had mentioned, I have a big cup of coffee with heavy cream, and then before I leave for work, I have another big cup of coffee, a big tumbler, because I have to drive for an hour, so I, have, I take a tumbler with me, and I put half and half, and I said, well, wait a minute. The first time you told me the story, because I had her take me through it again and again, mm -hmm. I said, the first time you said heavy cream, and then the second time you said half and half, which is it? And she goes, it's uh, heavy cream half and half. I said, well, that's <laughs> two different things. Are you putting heavy cream and half and half in your coffee? She goes, no, I'm putting heavy cream. I said, okay, why do you keep mentioning half and half? <laughs> and she goes, because I put half coffee and half heavy cream. Oh, wow. So I said, okay. <laughs> I said, can you figure out how many ounces goes into that mug in the morning? So she goes over to her kitchen. She fills up the mug with water. She pours it into a measuring cup. She goes, it says here 14 ounces. Okay. I said, okay. So you're telling me seven ounces of that is cream? She said, yeah, I put exactly half the cup as cream, and then I put the coffee on top. I said, okay, the mug that you take to work, the tumbler, how big is that? She measured it, 17 ounces. I said, okay, how much do you put in that? She goes, about half. I said, so let's call it eight ounces? She goes, yeah. I said, and you have breakfast with bacon and eggs? She goes, yeah. I said, okay. So with your bacon and eggs, in the morning, you're adding eight, and what did I say, five, four, what was it? Seven, seven eight, and seven. Yeah. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 ounces of basically oil. Heavy cream is basically oil. And she goes, yeah, that sounds about right. I said, and you don't see a problem. And she goes, I didn't think of it that way. I thought I could have all the cream, all the fat I wanted. Yeah. And you can't. You can't live that way, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when it comes to that, fat can become a problem. Did I answer the question the way you wanted it answered, or did I skip around too much? No, I think that explains it. I mean, if I had to summarize, I would say, you know, 
we've all been misled to think that fat makes us fat because fat has more calories per gram when in fact in moderation you know it's good to get the body to use fat to burn fat as an alternative energy source especially as it comes as a replacement for the glucose it's kind of the portion of plate theory that if you take all those grains off your plate you take all the sugar out you've got to add those calories back in and a great way to do it is with high quality fats but the big takeaway i think from gabriella's story is moderation because it is nine calories per gram as opposed to four calories per gram and so it, it's very easy to overdo it i mean my dad always complains to me that like well you know i, I ate too many nuts and i gained a ton of weight and it's like well yeah nine calories per gram they're very energy dense foods fats are Right. But the takeaway should also be that you can get away with more fat than you can carbohydrate, number one. Totally. And number two, and, and this is one of the things that Adam Carolla likes, and, and I, I reiterate it on my show and, and on his show a lot. The problem with fat is that it's called fat, you know, because we get fat and the nutrient we eat is fat. So I tell people, if you just change the name fat to energy, you know, I eat carbohydrates, proteins and energy then you won't really have a problem because you're not eating fat anymore. You're eating energy. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that we talk about this now because in light of kind of my last conversation with Rob, I just picked up a uh, Precision Extra, which does the blood testing and blood uh, ketone monitoring. Yeah. Just kind of as a, as a side hobby, I'm testing. And I realized last night, I realized I cannot eat white rice. My glucose went way over 140. So sure. white rice is out for me. Whereas like some fruit I can manage, I can stay under 130. But it's interesting. I think it's, it's worth discussing. Like what are, I mean, do you recommend blood glucose testing for your average kind of person to figure out what foods work for them and don't? Do you recommend ketone testing or is that level of tweaking and quantified self probably not advisable for your non-podcast owner, author, kind of obsessive, quantified self biohacker kind of person? I don't like the term biohacking. You know, I don't like the term hacking at all. <laughs> because, you know, I'm trying to get people just to be sensible. Now, I get it. If someone's metabolically broken, they want to be in ketosis. Okay, yeah, go get yourself a blood ketone monitor. If you think you might be diabetic or pre-diabetic, you may want to check your blood sugars and see where you are. That's good for that. That's what that stuff is invented for. I want the average person to not have to think about it. You know, and I get it. Rob and a lot of these guys are pushing that stuff. Hey, go do this. Go do that. Go hack. I'm trying to be more sensible. Like when I'm the guy who came up with the term NSNG, no sugars, no grains. I own that term. I own that trademark. Mm -hmm. And it's just very simple. Go live, eat, enjoy your vegetables, enjoy your meat, enjoy good, clean eating. And don't worry so much about testing. Now, again, if you have a problem, yeah. But mm -hmm. otherwise, all the hacking, you know, we didn't have hacking before when we were thin. Why do we need hacking now? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that's wise and sound advice for people who just want to get to the end results. I think there's something to be said about like taking an interest and in making your health a hobby in a sense. But yeah, I mean, for your average Joe, they don't really care. And I can tell, you know, when my blood sugar is high, because I feel kind of high, kind of not good, kind of, but it is interesting to, you know, accumulate that data if you're interested. Yeah. And as you said, you can always tell, I live in dietary ketosis only because I'm a cancer patient. I, I had cancer, leukemia back in 07. And I, I just like to keep starving the cancer. I don't want to have it come back any sooner than it has to. So it's a rare occasion when I will even have dessert. And not even on my birthday do I have dessert. Wow. But last summer, I was at my sister-in-law's house in France. It was her daughter's wedding. And we're in the French countryside. And someone showed up with uh, some profiteroles, you know, this pastry with ice cream and the whole thing. And on that rare occasion, I said, man, you know, I'm just going to indulge with everyone else. And I didn't even have a whole lot. Mm -hmm. But I immediately, because you know, my body just went into anaphylactic shock, if you will, not really, but, you know, it was like buzz. And then all of a sudden I looked at everyone and went, I think I need to go to bed. I, I just need to go 
lay down for a minute. Right. And I went in the other room and I was out cold, like someone had drugged me for about two hours. Jeez. Yeah. When you're not used to sugar, when you go years upon years without having it, your body really reacts to it. It doesn't like it. Absolutely. So would you recommend your average kind of person to live in dietary ketosis or is that, because I do know, you know, it is really interesting finding out that cancer cells feed basically on blood glucose. I think that's like a huge new development that we're only just realizing. Like it's not just body fat. It's not just heart disease. Like, Hey, you can actually starve out cancer cells, but for your average individual who hasn't had a history of cancer or maybe even in their family, do you recommend kind of living in dietary ketosis as you said? No, I don't. It's good if you're doing what I call fat adapted, where your body is easily going back between using its own glucose and using ketone bodies. Even if you're not in dietary ketosis, if you're eating far less you know, sugar and no grains, if you're getting it from vegetables, your body's going to build up a bunch of ketone bodies mm -hmm. that it can use. And I explain it like this. It's like being a, a Prius. You know, a Prius can run on battery or fossil fuel, right? And you don't feel it switching from one to the other. You know, when it's got enough, you know, battery, it will run on the battery. When it runs out of battery, it will switch over to gas. And your body can do that too. Your body can run on ketone bodies, as it should, as it did for a gazillion years. And it can then run on sugar, depending on what you need at the time. To be just in dietary ketosis where your body just really doesn't use sugar at all. It's a strict way to live. If you're me and you have cancer, yeah, okay. If you're metabolically broken and you weigh 400 pounds and you want to get it together and you don't want to have laparoscopic surgery, yeah, knock yourself out. Go into dietary ketosis mm -hmm. because you can save your life that way. Mm -hmm. If you have seizures, grand mal seizures, and you want to have less of them. It's been proven that dietary ketosis will help that. Yeah, absolutely. If you're in any kind of brain fog, you know, people who are getting Alzheimer's, you know, might be better if you lived in dietary ketosis. But not for everyone, no. I do really like that hybrid idea because I, I've had students reach out to me in the past and they're like, you know, I've heard you and Rob and many of the other guests talk about this phenomenon where like now if I eat a slice of pizza, I feel like crap. And I've had people reach out and they're like, I don't want to lose the ability to enjoy, you know, treat foods. So I like that metaphor of being a hybrid. Like I can run on gas if I need to gas being like the cheap, dirty energy, but I try to run on the clean energy as much as possible. I think that's a good thing to aspire to, like not completely getting to the point with any one food, even dairy, say, that you lose those enzymes and can never enjoy them again. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, I had uh, Johnny Bowden, another guy that's in the same you know realm. Yeah. I don't know if you've had him on your show or not, but Johnny came out to uh, one of my speeches about two weeks ago and he came up after the, the talk and to say hi. And uh, Johnny's been on my show before. And he goes, hey, I like that whole Prius thing. I, I think I'm going to use that in my talks. I said, Johnny, you can't come to my shows and steal my material. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way. And he goes, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. We haven't had him on the show yet, but I'll have to research him. I want to ask you this, Vinny. I know we're coming up a little bit short on time here. Where does exercise fit into all this? Because one of the things, you know, when I started becoming it's kind of like, you know, the whole, the paleo CrossFit joke, like someone does paleo and CrossFit, which one do they tell you about first? When I started becoming a paleo proselytite, a lot of people responded to me and they're like, well, that only works for you because you lift weights. So of course you can eat high protein, high fat. It wouldn't work for me because I don't train a lot. So I'm curious, you know, how much of this advice that we have kind of imparted on people today is dependent on having a exercise regime to go with it. And also within that, what is kind of the exercise regime that you most support for, for the kind of health that you're getting with your clients? Anyone who's watched any of my speeches, you know, of several of them are on video on YouTube at vinnytortorich.com. The first thing out of my mouth when I walk on stage is these words, exercise is a very poor way to lose weight. In order to think that you can lose weight with exercise is to consider that you also believe that calorie in, calorie out works because you're hoping to lose weight by creating a calorie deficit through exercise. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Now, 
Is exercise important? Yes, it's very important. It's good for your cardiovascular system, your skeletal muscular system. You know, if you want to stay young, just all you have to do is exercise. It, it builds cells. It builds mitochondria, keeps your heart strong. I could go on and on as to why everyone should exercise every day. So then the question becomes, what's better? Is it better to do high-intensity interval training? Is it better to stay in zone two? Is it better to stay in zone three and four and do high intensity aerobic training? You know, the question becomes what, when, and where? Well, it all depends on what you want to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to be really strong, well, just go do a lot of weightlifting. If you want to run a marathon, weightlifting is not going to do a whole hell of a lot for you, right? Vice versa, if you want to be strong in weightlifting and all you did was ran every day or rode a bike, good luck being strong in weightlifting. Sure. I tell people to take a cross section of all of it. Now, within all of that, when you say to me, Vinny, I want to use weightlifting, even though you say it's a bad way to lose weight, is there a way that I can use exercise to lose weight? And the answer is yes. And that's by doing a lot of zone two training. Hmm. And what zone two training refers to is when you're doing any aerobic exercise, and I don't care if you're rowing, or on the elliptical, or running, or on the treadmill, or a stationary bike, hiking, I don't care where you are. If you can stay between 70 and 79% of your aerobic capacity, you're burning the optimal amount of fat that you can burn without burning any of your glycogen. And that's where high intensity interval training falls a little short. Because basically when you're doing HIT. You're doing nothing but burning your blood glycogen, which means that you now have to go take it back on again, which now means that you're going to create an insulin spike and cause more inflammation and more of a problem. Does that make sense? It does. Although I was always told that the beauty of HIT is that in the recovery phase, long term, you'll burn a lot more calories as the body. I don't know exactly how it works, to be honest. So yeah, but you see, that's considering that you believe calorie in, calorie out works. You're not trying to burn calories. Right. You see, that's where the confusion comes in, and that's where bro science takes over. <laughs> like, hey, bro, if you got a Cadillac, bro, you got to have a bigger engine. It takes more gas to burn, bro. So you want right. to build a big engine. You, that doesn't work that way. If it did, we're not automobiles. We're humans. Interesting. We're animals. You know, we gain and lose weight based on hormones. Interesting. So although I will say, like, one experience that I've had is – when I was, say, 145 pounds versus 165 pounds, and all of that difference was muscle, just the sheer, I mean, assuming all of my kind of food was the same and all of my kind of hormones, and you could argue that my gut flora changed when I moved countries, but probably not that significantly in that short period of time, I did need to consume a lot more calories. But you're saying that wouldn't be your primary recommendation of kind of like build more muscle to burn more calories because it's just not effective. And it's kind of, there's not a direct correlation you're saying. No. And when you build more muscle, now you have to feed more muscle, which means you have to eat more calories. You yeah. can't have a calorie deficit and live long term. Mm -hmm. You see, that's the part when people start talking about thermodynamics when it comes to humans. And, you know, I get this on Twitter all the time. What about the laws of thermodynamics? What about them? If you create a bigger motor, now you have to feed a bigger motor. Right. You know, you can't live on less and expect that muscle to stay there, right? Totally. So essentially you're saying, I mean, it is kind of a known factor that the muscle is not going to be fed by body fat, right? Like body right. fat is only going to be burned by kind of the metabolism and also obviously by brown adipose tissue, which is why I think cold exposure is, is so interesting for burning calories. But at the end of the day, you're trying to kind of nip that whole calories in, calories out conversation in the bud and just talk about quality of food, which I love. And I think that's that's a message that we hear time and time and time again with an asterisk because of Gabriella, you know, but I really like that message of like, just stop worrying about the thermodynamics in your body and eat the right foods. Yeah, it really does work. Look, you don't make it. I've been doing this as a career for 36, almost 37 years. I've been out here in Hollywood doing it since 1991. So that's 26 of those years. Wow. And I've had a very, very high success rate. I'm not bragging. I'm saying that you don't 
get successful by failing. Mm -hmm. You know, people out here are just going to hire the guy that's going to get the job done. And I'm not the only guy, but I can tell you every guy that's getting the job done out here is doing similar work. Right. Right. So let me shift gears here as we kind of wrap up, Vinny, and I want to ask you, what are some products or resources that you simply can't do your job without? Wow, products. Total gear shift change, but I realized just now that I've only got a few more minutes of your time. So Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a big product guy. I do like, as far as products go, and this is old school, I like the heart rate monitor because you can really you know, see where you are in your zones whenever you're training. Mm-hmm. So all of my clients have that. I have them on everything, my bikes, my, when I run, what have you. Multivitamins. I talk about this all the time. You know, our land has been raped and the vegetables, we don't get the amount of vitamins we used to get. We have the 13 essential vitamins out there and we just don't get what we need. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's very important that people get what they need. So taking a, a good multivitamin, full disclosure, I own a vitamin company. I'm not saying you have to take mine, but <laughs> take some bodies. Yeah. I won't even mention the name of mine. It's worth knowing. I'm curious. I started a brand called purevitaminclub.com. It's unlike anything on the market. I make these things. It's not some white labeled crap. I third party test my own vitamins twice a year just to make sure that the, the manufacturer that puts them together is not cheating. Mm -hmm. There's no fillers. There's no flow agents, no excipients. You're getting the best vitamins in the world at the cheapest price you can possibly get them at. Awesome. I'm going to check that out and we'll put a link to that one in the uh, podcast oh, cool. as well because that's always man. something that I'm looking into. I'm currently like really big on the Metagenics products, which were recommended to me by a few different guests on the show, but I'm always interested in because, you know, once you start to understand this stuff well enough, you realize like you go down to the CVS or whatever, pick up magnesium and it's magnesium oxide, you know, which anyone with an internet connection can determine is like, you might as well not take anything. Let me ask you this. If you wanted to get a magnesium, right, what would you want your magnesium to have in it? So it, it's evolved over the years. For a while, I was kind of uh, really hot on the magnesium bisglycinate. But then I learned that magnesium, I can never pronounce it with the T, try T something, is actually higher absorption. I imagine it would be a combination of a couple of the different ones. Well, if you get a chance, when you go down the rabbit hole of checking out purevitaminclub.com, mm -hmm. check out my magnesium. I, I think you might be impressed with it. Which different forms does it use? We have um, magnesium carbonate, magnesium citrate, taurate, and glyconate. We have four magnesiums in the broad spectrum magnesium. Yep, that was the one, titrate and taurate, and then obviously the glyconate. Amazing. Yeah. And by the way, we put all four of those, every time you take a pill, one of the vitamin capsules, you get all four of those in one capsule. Total price, what do you think a 90-day supply of that costs? I mean, I'm looking at the website now, so I would say it would cost more than it does. How about that? <laughs> yeah. twenty one ninety five. <laughs> Yeah, not bad at all. For 90 days, that's what's made this company so successful, is that there is no BS. It's here is the best product on the market. Here it is. I said twenty one ninety five. Sorry, it's twenty four ninety five. But still, right. I mean, think about it. 90 day supply. That's less than, you know. Incredible. What? That's less than $10 a month. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. So Vinny, let me, as we kind of wrap up, give you an opportunity to share other places that people can get in touch with you besides Pure Vitamin Club. Where should people learn more, reach out, check out your stuff? The best place to go is uh, vinnytortorich.com. V-I-N-N-I-E, T as in Tom, O-R, T as in Tom, O-R-I-C-H. Awesome. Go there, all of the podcasts. We have 800 Samad podcasts up and uh, you can see them all there. Uh, you could book a consult with me. I do consults. You could get my book, Fitness Confidential. Perfect. The podcast is called Fitness Confidential and uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter every day, all day. 
Amazing. All right. We will link to all that stuff in the blog post episode. And just before we close out, I want to ask you the one question that we like to ask at the end of every show, which is if people really just take away one message and they carry it with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that message to be? Wow. Always ask questions. Always. Just always ask questions. That, that's the only way you will learn. So Don't long. take what I'm telling you today. Don't take what anyone tells you at face value. Take it, go down rabbit holes, study, ask questions. It's the only way you're going to get through life. Solid one. Mr. Vinny, I want to thank you so very much for your time. It was really a pleasure. I, you know, even talking about subjects that we've covered before, I always am able to dig up and learn new stuff. So I appreciate it. And I know our audience enjoyed it very much. Jonathan, thanks for having me on. All right. You take care, Vinny. All right, super friends, that's it for this week's episode. We hope you really, really enjoyed it and learn a ton of applicable stuff that can help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If so, please do us a favor and leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or however you found this podcast. In addition to that, we are always looking for great guest posts on the blog or awesome guests right here on the podcast. So if you know somebody or you are somebody or you have thought of somebody who would be a great fit for the show or for our blog, please reach out to us either on Twitter or by email. Our email is info at becomingasuperhuman.com. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies, or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.